thanks so much for the introduction, Carol. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here. Um, and thanks to the committee for choosing me, and Jonathan and Carol, both of you for the organizing effort. I, I really appreciate it. I mean, Mark Sklowski, I, I never had a chance to meet him, but I, um, so the, the two volumes you mentioned of African American philosophy, of course, are very familiar to me and was one of those things that having an opportunity to see that collection from the 70s and then in the 90s, and John Pittman is here who uh, published later the, the, the 92 version, um, uh, a huge impact on you know, my sense that this is a, a, a place one can work and, um, and, and find a hearing for, for work at, at the intersection of philosophy and African American studies. So, um, so it is an honor to be able to, to give this memorial lecture. Uh, and I hope some of the themes that I talk about will, um, will, will seem in the right spirit. <clears throat> so many people today think that prison systems around the globe, especially in the United States, are in need of major reform. Some people, however, think that we shouldn't so much try to reform prisons, but to stop using them altogether. Now, anti-prison theory, I should say, is remarkably varied. There are socialist strands, there are pacifist strands, there are anarchist strands of thought and activism. And I'm not going to try to engage all those, all those arguments here um, today. Um, and then I'm going to focus on a, a fairly moderate form of prison abolition, um, a call that is sometimes described as a, a call to dismantle the prison industrial complex. And I'm going to argue that uh, this form of abolition, while I think in many ways is an insightful and, and important and appealing, um, does have some serious weaknesses, I think, as a kind of moral critique. I'm going to try to highlight some of those. Uh, and I'm also going to su suggest, it's not original with me, but I'm going to try to articulate it in maybe a slightly more philosophical way, uh, defend a use of nonprofit prison privatization in at least certain very limited contexts, in particular uh, in societies that, while we're maintaining some measure of legitimacy, are uh, nonetheless marred by rather serious injustices. So I'm going to focus on the work of Angela Davis. I mean, there are many abolitionists, but obviously Davis is a, a leading scholar, activist, and abolitionist <coughs> movement, and a very influential social philosopher. Various books and essays and speeches, interviews, spanning now really nearly 50 years, she has defended a world without prisons, whether public or private, as a morally required and realistic political goal. Now, some people who are sympathetic to the abolitionist cause, they stop short of a complete ban on prisons. Um, they allow that incarceration, whether, say, it's detention or it's punishment, has, or at least could have, some legitimate public function. Yet they're deeply troubled, and sometimes quite outraged, by the ways in which privatization, commerce, and profit figure in some prison systems, particularly in the United States. So, taking inspiration from Davis, they sometimes call for an end to the prison industrial complex, though not to prisons as such. Others see the complete abolition of prisons as, say, a long-term objective, um, but treat abolition of the prison industrial complex as, a, say, an intermediate goal. So decoupling capitalist enterprise from incarceration is, for this group, a necessary step toward a prison-free world. Now, of course, philosophers have written extensively about punishment and its moral justification. They have devised theories based on retribution, deterrence, consent, forfeiture, fairness, reconciliation, rehabilitation, moral education, many other things. However, these theories typically abstract away from the concrete realities of imprisonment. They also ordinarily abstract away from related questions of, say, political economy and public finance. Moreover, philosophers usually assume, in the context of their theorizing, that the societies within which imprisonment occurs, that these societies are basically just. But of course, what has to be shown, if it can be, is that imprisonment is a morally permissible and cost-effective in our own unjust society and world. Or at least that it could be so justified in a world that's, say, not too distant from our own. And Davis raises a, a range of serious doubts about whether this kind of justification is really possible. Now, Davis believes that prisons are obsolete, 
talk about obsolescence and suggest that although prisons may have had some legitimate uses in the past, that they're currently unnecessary. Either because, say, these legitimate functions cannot be served in a better and less costly way, or because they're no longer needed to serve these functions at all. Davis also views prison abolition as a necessary component of resistance to what some would call neoliberalism and a key demand in a democratic socialist movement. <clears throat> a U.S. federal, state, and municipal prisons are often, of course, grossly unjust and inhumane. And they contain far too many people who should never have been confined to begin with. Indeed, elsewhere, I've tried to question the legitimacy of the American criminal justice system. Yet, because some prisons are better than others, to decide whether to be a reformer or an abolitionist, then we need to have some idea about what a prison is and not just what some existing prisons are like. We need to sort of grasp the features that are constitutive, if you like, of prisons and which can be discarded or and which ones can be discarded or altered without, say, doing away with prisons altogether. So I'm not going to pretend here that there's um, some ideological neutral conception of the prison or that I've somehow intuited the platonic form of the prison or anything. Um, but I do hope to offer a conception that reformers and abolitionists can accept. So that the issue really turns on um, not so much contentious definitions or verbal disputes, but rather on whether the familiar practice of imprisonment is one that on moral grounds should be abandoned. So when I just say there is a hand, I hope everyone has it. Um, it might be a little easier. It's just an outline, so you don't need to look at it, but in case you might have some definitions that might be helpful. So I'm going to treat incarceration as my general category, and I'm going to regard imprisonment, and so prisons, as a type of incarceration. So incarceration here broadly understood has, uh, I take it, five elements. It entails involuntary confinement, like restriction to a limited space with no right to leave without permission from authorities. And the social spatial site of confinement is an enclosed space with a physically secure perimeter, walls, fences, guards, locks, so on, to prevent escape and unauthorized entry. Incarceration is a, a hierarchical institutional practice. It has a set of uh, pretty well-defined rules and roles and goals. It's not just a building with a lock inside. These rules and roles, they vary with the overall justificatory aim of the institution, and sometimes, of course, with the covert purposes of officials. Now, those who are confined to carceral spaces, I'm going to call them inmates, are isolated from the general public, so separated from others in the outside world, sometimes um, from one another, and they have rather highly restricted, if any, rights to visitation and to communicate with those outside the institution, sometimes even within the facility. Importantly, inmates are in the custody of carceral authorities. And here I understand custody as a kind of guardianship, I feel like, which includes providing necessary shelter, care, and protection from harm, including self-harm. So of course, inmates are a known danger to others, perhaps to themselves, and they have to sometimes be deprived of things that might um, uh, cause harm, bodily harm to others or themselves. Providing adequate protection is sometimes going to require surveillance, sometimes going to require searches, and enforcement of various rules of order. <laughs> So incarceration, understood in this way, can be used for a variety of purposes. Some of these are going to be legitimate. So for instance, not to highlight this fact, I didn't think of this when I wrote, when I wrote this, but incarceration can be used to quarantine those with highly infectious and dangerous diseases. Um, it can sometimes uh, be used to hold enemy combatants in times of war. Uh, and of course, some of these uses of incarceration are clearly illegitimate. So to keep a population available for exploitation, or to repress political dissent, or to torture uh, inmates, or use them for medical experiments, and so on. So even within the context of crime control, incarceration can have a number of purposes. So, for instance, um, there is sort of pretrial detention, which raises, uh, I think, a number of, of, of difficult issues about reform versus abolition, uh, abolition of the prison industrial complex. <coughs> Put those to one side. Or we can talk about them if you like, but. I'm, just for, for time, I'm going to put them to one side. And instead, I'm going to focus on incarceration when its official purpose is punishment. Penalty for committing a crime. And in fact, Davis uses the phrase punitive incarceration 
to differentiate it from incarceration and, say, pretrial detention. Now, one of Davis's core objections to punitive incarceration is that, as generally practiced, it's an immoral fusion of ineffective state crime control measures, the privatization of various public functions, and the maximization of corporate profit. And she seeks to abolish prisons partly because she views them as components of a vast and destructive, what you call, uh, prison industrial complex. Now, this designation, she tells us, is meant to draw attention to the fact that prison construction, prison ownership, prison administration, prison services, and inmate labor, these all attract large amounts of private capital. And that commercial profit from the practice of imprisonment is at least one important driver of mass incarceration. Now, one way to argue for the abolition of the prison industrial complex is to focus critical attention not so much on prisons, but instead to focus on capitalism. So, for instance, the, the critic of the prison industrial complex could argue, say, that capitalism is an oppressive social system. Say, it's unjust, it's undemocratic, it's dehumanizing, exploitative, what have you. And so its basic institutions, private ownership of productive assets, wage labor, markets, private finance, that these should be eradicated. On anti-capitalist grounds, it would also be, of course, natural to oppose the prison industrial, industrial complex, as it necessarily relies on, that is, it cannot exist without capitalist institutions. But this round of opposition would also apply to many private institutions and organizations, schools, hospitals, banks, communication networks, transportation companies, homes for the elderly, on and on and on. The thesis that the prison industrial complex should be abolished would then just be, say, a theorem derived from the more general claim that capitalism should be abolished. An institution necessarily depends on an inherently unjust practice, I take it, can never really be fully legitimate and would be morally tainted by its association with uh, the oppressive practice. But prisons wouldn't be special in that regard. And the critical task would be to convince skeptics that no form of capitalism would be just, or could be just, I should say, which at least on one plausible interpretation is Marx's aim in capital. Yet Davis and other abolitionists have objections to the prison industrial complex apart from their, say, general objections to capitalism. They're concerned with how prisons interact with or sh are shaped by capitalism. And these concerns are going to be my focus. So in order to try to isolate that set of worries, um, keeping them distinct from opposition to capitalism itself, what I'm going to do is assume that capitalism is not inherently unjust. Now, don't assume that existing capitalist practices are just, far, far from it. I, I assume, <clears throat> here really for purposes of, of argument, just to kind of focus our, our minds, um, that there is a realistic form of capitalism that would be compatible with a stable, just, and democratic society. To gain further clarity about what, morally speaking, is at issue here, I think we need to be somewhat explicit about some relevant terms. I'm sorry for the, that this is really boring, but sometimes you have to do this. Um, so privatization is the process by which a property or enterprise goes from being gov um, government-owned to being privately owned. Privatization can involve at least two types of rights transfer. Right? You can be able to transfer ownership rights to assets, land, facilities, vehicles, machinery, whatnot. Or it could be a transfer of operating rights to an enterprise, say, prerogative to provide various sort of goods and services. Sometimes a public function, law enforcement, you know, uh, education, sanitation, whatnot, this might be carried out by some private organization rather than, say, by uh, uh, some state agency or, or a set of public service employees. So this kind of outsourcing arrangement is facilitated by uh, a kind of a public-private contract, and it needn't involve a, a transfer of ownership rights. Public institutions also often make use of private suppliers um, for goods and resources needed to carry out relevant public functions, and they can do this without turning over, say, any property rights or operating um, functions. Private organizations can be for-profit or non-profit, here, I'm understanding profit as a financial benefit that is realized when the amount of revenue gained from a business enterprise exceeds the cost, including taxes, needed to sustain the enterprise. 
The purpose or primary goal of a for-profit organization is, of course, to secure profit. Any profit that's gained through the enterprise belongs to the business owners who are free to decide what they're going to spend it on. Reinvestment in the enterprise, other stocks and bonds, personal consumption, might donate it, lobby, <coughs> lobby, and whatnot. And of course, they're free to just save it for future use. A nonprofit, nonprofit private organization exists for purposes other than generating profit, such as, say, serving a, a given community or benefiting the, the larger general public. <coughs> Although the organization's members may be concerned with revenue, with costs, with debts, efficiency, and so on. I take it that they're going to be concerned about these financial matters only insofar as they bear on keeping the organization operating or making it operate better. Members of a nonprofit do not own stock in the organization, and so they don't have a claim on financial benefits based on ownership rights. Now, labor compensation is different from profit, although both can serve as, say, a motive or a reward. Labor compensation is a financial benefit that's derived from providing a given service or, or performing some task. So it's payment in exchange for actual work. Such payment can be given to public service employees um, working for a government agency or to employees working for a private organization, whether profit or nonprofit. Employees are free, of course, to decide what they're going to spend their compensation on. Again, they might spend it on stock, consumption, gifts, lobbying, etc or they can save for future use. The distinction between commercial profit and labor compensation is, is meant here to track the difference between deriving a financial benefit from ownership and deriving it from work. So with, with this set of distinctions, I, if we can I think, more readily see that objections to the prison industrial complex can take a variety of forms. So I'm going to leave aside objections on grounds, say, of cost-effectiveness, and I'm going to focus really here on moral objections. What kinds of objections? Well, for instance, one might be concerned that some private organizations are wrongly earning or attempting to earn profit from prisons. Or the objection might be to granting administrative power over prisoners to uh, private organizations. Or perhaps the issue is which specific prison functions are being outsourced to the private sector. Or the concern may be over ownership rights, which, uh, of course, its own form of power, a type of power that, um, when it comes to prisons, is perhaps only legitimately held by the public to some maintain. Talk about corruption for a minute. So I'm going to assume with Davis that retribution for wrongdoing is not a legitimate public function. That is, I'm not going to rely on the premise that those who commit crimes deserve to suffer and that the state has a right to use incarceration to ensure that they endure this suffering. But at least on a pretty influential view, the principal purpose of prisons, like law enforcement agencies um, generally, is to provide security to the general public by controlling crime. That is, by keeping crime within tolerable levels so that everyone's basic liberties and property are adequately secure. The provision of this essential public good is, of course, a fundamental state responsibility, and the um, some accounts is the primary justification for governmental authority and for the state's claim on monopoly over the use of coercion and violence. Davis claims, however, that for profit companies in the prison industry do not actually seek to provide security, but only to make money for shareholders. The real function of these institutions is to amass private wealth under the ideological cover of providing a necessary public good. Prison privatization, then, is really just a scam. It's a way of accumulating private capital using public funds, sometimes using prison labor, and on the pretext of making an essential contribution to public safety. Now, this kind of critique uh, reaches beyond the sort of familiar charge that capitalists are, say, greedy and indifferent to the human cost of their enterprises. It's, it's an objection to, say, neoliberal governance, and in particular to private, to public-private contracts to carry out public functions. So in this case, so <coughs> governments, they, they make contracts to private companies and prison-related industries. And presumably, these contracts wouldn't be renewed unless the government uh, its officials were satisfied with the services that were provided. Some provisos here um, um, 
that to be sufficient competition um, um, in order for that condition to be, to be, to be met. This suggests that these officials and perhaps institutions of which they are a part are, are really corrupt. They are colluding with businesses that profit from public revenue without, in this case, providing the relevant public good. For-profit companies often engage in lobbying efforts of various sorts. Uh, they exacerbate the problem of corruption among public officials. They sometimes participate in mis misinformation campaigns that mislead the public, and try to sway the public over in their favor. Um, and I don't have any, any doubt about the reality or seriousness of these problems of, of corruption. Um, yeah, I take it as fairly straightforward. These are cases where the authorities are clearly misusing carceral institutions and abusing their power <coughs> to make and implement crime control policies. And something similar happens in other domains, whether that's education or healthcare or housing or whatnot. And it's, it's worth emphasizing that a similar form of corruption can occur within a wholly public prison system. So public officials, too, can be indifferent to whether prisons help to secure public safety. Their chief concern is sometimes keeping their jobs, along with the compensation, the power, and the status that's attached to their positions. And it's not just high-level public officials who have motives that could undermine public functions. Lower-level public service employees may be similarly motivated. So, for instance, prison guard unions have a financial stake in keeping prisons open and full, regardless of whether this would prevent crime or rehabilitate inmates. So, con consequently, they may be tempted to defend the need for draconian sentences. And they also have an incentive to resist managerial or technological innovations that might reduce the need for correctional officers. Unfortunately, the broader public often fails to check these abuses. Citizens, um, of course, might not hold officials and public employees accountable for their poor performance um, in ethical, unethical conduct because they might have, say, limited uh, collective efficacy, or maybe they don't know about the corruption, or but perhaps they're just insufficiently concerned about the problem. Perhaps they don't lack sufficient sympathy for those who are convicted of serious crimes and so don't intervene. The vice of being indifferent to whether a public good is adequately provided can afflict public institutions and private organizations. Whenever it's possible to continue, say, acquiring um, various benefits regardless of the quality of the goods and services provided, then we, we shouldn't really be surprised if, if some fail to carry out their, these responsibilities in a, in a conscientious way. Private organizations um, clearly don't have a, a monopoly on institutional corruption, and such corruption um, to, of course, be uh, exposed, it needs to be ended, and that's going to require pretty vigilant uh, attention from both the public and the, the private sector. But I'm going to put that set of issues of institutional corruption to one side, um, and I'm going to do it this way. So let's, let's suppose that the relevant private organizations actually provide adequate services in a cost-effective way. Would the fact that profit is their motive and reward provides sufficient reason to prohibit the practice of privatizing prisons. Now, Davis thinks so, and she gives two main reasons. Um, she objects to the source of these profits, namely the intentional deprivation of freedom and imposition of hardships on inmates and their families. She also thinks that the profit motive undermines the effective provision of public goods, in this case, security and is a strong incentive to maintain horrid prison conditions as a cost-cutting measure to maximize profit. Now, this first concern, the unsavory source of profit, suggests that the relevant principle is something like no one should gain financially from the suffering caused by imprisonment. And even if prisons were constructed, maintained, administered solely by public service employees, these employees' labor would and should be compensated, uh, and so they will be gained financially from the suffering of inmates and their loved ones. Perhaps the objection is not uh, to fair compensation for necessary work, but rather to profiting from ownership of prison industry firms. But it doesn't seem to me that the distinction between profit and labor compensation really helps here. 
because at least some financial gain from property rights would appear to be permissible in this domain. So for example, prisons, they need supplies and resources, they need food and clothes, equipment, toiletries, fuel, many, many things that in a capitalist society is going to be provided at least partially by for-profit organizations. The owners or shareholders of these companies will therefore profit from prisoners suffering and curtail freedom. The incarceration makes capital gains possible for at least some employees of public prisons. For they, or at least the highly paid among them, can of course use a portion of their pay to buy shares in companies when its ownership may yield financial benefits. Although, of course, that's somewhat indirect, this too would be profiting from the suffering caused by incarceration. A slightly different underlying principle is, is something like this. No one should profit from the harmful wrongdoing of others, in this case, say, from the serious crimes of prisoners. But again, it strikes me as overly broad, and really for pretty much the same reasons. Medical personnel and hospitals, I, don't, I take it, don't do any wrong when they expect to be paid for treating victims of violent crimes. And a private company reasonably expects to turn a profit from the sale of its goods and services that will be used in that kind of medical treatment. It could be maintained that one is permitted to profit from others' harmful wrongdoing, but only if, in doing so, one also contributes to repairing the harm, redressing the harm, the wrong or preventing further such wrongdoing. So that might be able to account for the, the, the apparent moral acceptability of the medical case I just gave. But uh, I take it that a private prison that, say, contains convicted violent offenders will at least sometimes satisfy this condition as well. So I'm going to think that, that a, a somewhat sounder principle would be something like this, that one should not seek to profit from suffering caused by injustices that one has perpetrated. In other words, it's wrong to act so as to profit from one's own harmful wrongdoing. Of course, one might inadvertently profit from a wrong one's committed, but one may not act wrongly so as to profit from the wrong. I think it's pretty widely and rightly regarded, um, uh, regarded as impermissible. And so I think Davis's to the extent that she's committed to something like that, I think is on, on, on very firm ground. To that extent, um, to the extent that a corporation is blameworthy, say, for creating or perpetuating crime, then it shouldn't turn this wrongdoing to its advantage by profiting from prisons. So that point I'm going to return to in a moment has some implications that I think are important to draw out. Now, there was a second concern with profit from prisons is that it creates perverse incentives. Maybe practical reasons to lock up people when to impose long sentences, even when this won't prevent um, crime. Take it clearly, morally unacceptable situation when there exists operative reasons to impose unnecessary suffering. So in response to this legitimate worry, reformers could insist, say, that arrests, indictments, verdicts, sentencing, release decisions, that all these be made um, by people who don't have a financial stake right, in the outcome of those decisions. So maybe um, people who can't be hired or fired by someone with such a state. And then also maintain that government officials who regulate the prison industry should be prevented from having any financial stake in that industry. The reform efforts would be, in this case, directed toward reducing conflicts of interest between actors in prison-related firms and the aim of fair and humane crime prevention. And no reasonable, honest offender of prison privatization believes that the corrections industry should be free to sort of operate without any kind of oversight or government regulation. But I still think this kind of response is, is not entirely adequate, um, as the problem seems to run deeper, because there's at least uh, uh, another perverse incentive that we should attend to, and that is the, the incentive to keep the cost of prison administration as low as possible so as to increase profits. And that kind of incentive can lead to limiting or cutting educational, healthcare, psychiatric rehabilitative services. It can lead to reducing correctional staff to dangerously low levels, um, or to hiring the cheapest workers available without really any regard to whether they're competent or committed to doing the job well. Now, of course, this cost-cutting problem can negatively affect the administration of public prisons, too. Right? Public revenue is limited. 
their budgetary constraints um, and budgetary considerations, including public debt and deficits, can lead to the elimination of important prison programs and the hiring of inadequate staff. And the public, given its typically contemptuous attitude toward prisoners and often a pretty strong embrace of retributive sentiments, may not support greater spending or higher taxes to improve the lives and safety of prisoners. So placing a kind of democratic constraint on what public officials may do to improve prisons. So the incentive to keep costs down, whether they increase profit margins or to stay within budgetary constraints, is of course powerful and present for public and private organizations. <clears throat> However, the incentive to cut costs, even for vital goods and services, is, is, is clearly inherent in the case of for-profit enterprises. It's not, there's really no way to kind of eliminate it. The, the public can only try through government oversight and regulation to try to prevent corporations from acting on the incentive in a way that undermines um, the provision of adequate public goods and services. You can contrast that in the case with the public. The public could, of course, be convinced, say on grounds of justice or on human rights or public safety, to spend more money on prisons and prison services. And so that's at least one reason to prefer public prisons over privatized for-profit prisons, though perhaps not, not a decisive one. But there's another reason. Um, not only do for-profit private prisons have no incentive to rehabilitate prisoners or to reduce recidivism, they clearly have an incentive to promote crime and criminality. Creating prison conditions that make prisoners more likely to reoffend once they're released or more likely to violate prison rules so that they can be kept longer is actually good for business. So insofar as they exacerbate the crime problem in this way, then they clearly are profiting from suffering caused by their own unjust actions. The injustices issued here are encouraging criminal activity and complicity in any subsequent crime. The temptation to engage in such wrongdoing might be so strong and the resulting harm so enormous that it just would be better not to run the risk of using for profit private prisons. The general public is not subject to the same kinds of temptations because it seeks cost-effective ways to limit crime. Efficient crime control means not only greater public safety, but it means more public resources for things like schools and hospitals and parks and so on. It could be argued that the problem is not so much profiting from prison ownership or prison administration as it is profiting from prison labor. Private companies do sometimes contract with uh, the state to gain access to cheap prison labor. They do that in public and in private uh, prisons. Yet where inmates can refuse to work for private companies without incurring penalty, penalty, the fact that a private company profits from inmates' labor doesn't strike me as in itself unjust, unless capitalism is unjust. Many non-incarcerated persons clearly to meet their material needs seek employment for from uh, for-profit companies to pay that pay sometimes quite low wages. <clears throat> now perhaps Marx was right that wage labor under capitalism is a form of slavery. Right? It's a dehumanizing form of servitude under despotic rule. But if so, prison labor that benefits private firms would I take it just be an instance of a much uh, more widespread unjust practice that occurs inside and outside prison walls. And so not a distinctive form of oppression. And the call, again, should therefore be for the abolition of capitalism and not the abolition of prisons. But in any case, the reformer could just insist that profit um, can be secured from prisons without extracting it directly from the labor of prisoners. And so ending prison labor or, say, raising prisoners' wages is not really going to abolish the prison, the prison industrial complex. Now, one motive for the privatization of a public function is to weaken organized labor, which keeps wages low, the compensation low, or non-existent. And, of course, this is an objectionable way to reduce public expenses, because it's going to leave workers sort of vulnerable to exploitation. It's going to wrongly reduce the value of their basic liberties. And it's clear that government can save money by relying on 
private companies, partly because these companies unfairly squeeze labor, including prohibiting or undermining unions. But it seems like reform might be possible here, too, right? Government could get some advantages of agreements with private companies, e efficiency due to specialization and economies of scale, while only contracting services of vendors with fair labor practices, including respecting the right of workers to organize and strike. Now, Davis opposes public prisons that rely on for-profit companies for any goods and services. And she extends her critique to domains beyond law enforcement. She argues that there are certain vital public goods, like security, education, shelter, health care, and so on. These things, she thinks, should be available to everyone on the basis of need alone. Private for-profit companies should play no role in the provision of these public goods on her account. And so therefore, these public services, she argues, have to be moved entirely to the public sector. You know, but it strikes me, um, and I'm curious to, to hear your take on this, but it strikes me that it would be difficult to, to, for a, a non-socialist government to ensure universal access to education, health care, and housing without pretty extensive reliance on for-profit companies. Um, some of the personnel, the supplies, the technology, the vehicles, facilities needed to provide these goods and services, it strikes me that they're going to have to sort of come from um, the for-profit private sector. So if you just sort of consider, I was thinking, if you consider um, uh, what it would take to build and maintain a single high school. There's buildings, hundreds of books, computers, desks, chairs, electricity, food, clean water, sporting equipment, art supplies, clean supplies, maintenance equipment, many, many things just to, just to do that. Um, uh, so to avoid a re reliance on for-profit companies completely, it, it would seem that government would have to take over um, almost the entire economy is to ensure that uh, children have access to a decent school. At the very least, government would have to uh, enable, support, and rely solely on nonprofit profit worker cooperatives. <clears throat> but again, it strikes me as making Davis's opposition to privatization, whether prisons or anything else, um, just as a consequence of our opposition to, to capitalism. So it doesn't really have to do with prisons per se. Okay, so the critique of the prison industrial complex, again, but not simply an expression of anti-capitalism, is best regarded, I want to suggest, as opposition to a kind of deeper structural injustice in background conditions. So under current unjust background social conditions, a scheme of cooperation between the public uh, penal system and the corporate world is, of course, deeply worrisome, even frightening. Such collaboration is going to have many, many perils that are, would seem difficult, not impossible, to contain adequately through government regulation and public accountability, various public accountability measures. Moreover, continuing reliance on for profit prisons would likely further erode public trust in the criminal justice system, which, of course, needs to be widely accepted as legitimate if it's to be effective at crime control. To, to maintain or regain political legitimacy, criminal justice must not only be done, it has to be seen <laughs> to be done. The transparency, the accountability, uh, they're going to be quite crucial here, and commercial mechanisms and the profit motive can inhibit these democratic ends. But notice that the choice is not really limited to publicly owned, fully government operated prisons on the one hand, or private, for profit prisons. There is, at least theoretically, also the possibility of a nonprofit private organization administering and perhaps owning a prison facility. Prison privatization without profit could be a viable option, at least under certain special circumstances. Now, this kind of proposal uh, immediately raises at least three questions. Um, first, how, practically speaking, will such an arrangement work? Second, why well, I think this arrangement would be better from a moral point of view than alternatives, public prisons, private for-profit, or no prisons at all? And third, under what circumstances would this public nonprofit arrangement be justified? So let me try to get some answers, and I'll be, be fairly brief. A well-funded private organization concerned to protect the interests of a vulnerable population or promote the public good 
could make a contract with the, with the government, local, state, federal, to take over some core carceral functions. Among these functions are going to be ensuring prisoner safety from others' aggression and from self-harm, health care, including mental health care, nutrition and physical fitness, maintenance and sanitation, supervision and, uh, uh, supervision and perimeter security, discipline for prison rule violations, facilitating in-person and remote interaction between prisoners and their families and friends, and educational and vocational pro um, services, including um, those designed to help with reentry. Now, some might object to permitting private agents to use coercion or violence against prisoners, insisting that the use of force should never be delegated from the public to the private sector. So let's just assume for a moment that that's correct. Um, I think it wouldn't rule out nonprofit private prison administration and services so that enforcement of the prison's perimeter to prevent escape and unauthorized entry, and the use of force to ensure safety and order and discipline inside the prison could, could say, remain <laughs> exclusively in the hands of agents of the state, that is, in this case, public employees trained and officially authorized to play this role. And so then the remaining functions would be in the hands of a private, or, private organization and its employees and volunteers, subject, of course, to some public rules and accountability measures. <clears throat> So this will be, be rather similar to what a lot of other private organizations do. So for example, private universities and hospitals, um, they often say rely on police for certain purposes and under certain circumstances. Um, so the, the question of the use of coercion and violence is um, public officials can be brought in to handle some parts of that. Now let's assume that some coercive functions can be outsourced or privatized. After all, physical force is sometimes used in, say, private psychiatric hospitals and some private schools mm -hmm. and so on. But to the extent that private security is relied upon, this kind of personnel maybe we require that they get specialized training, maybe they get, you know, so that's sort of publicly approved, they go do psychological evaluation, background checks, and so on. Perhaps all correctional officers uh, in the private organization should be required to pass certain tests and to secure a license to serve in this capacity. Not unusual in the professions. This is already true, say, of medical personnel who work in prisons, whether it be public or private. To reduce reliance on coercion and violence in such a facility, it might be advisable to permit only nonviolent offenders to be admitted to a private prison. Where inmates convicted of violent offenses could be permitted, but maybe only if um, given say, some objective risk assessment that they are appropriate for, say, a minimum or medium security prison. All prisoners who, for reasons of custodial care or security, are best held in a maximum security facility, perhaps um, should be excluded from any, any private, even if nonprofit, prison. If the major administrative and service roles within the prison were, under, were undertaken by the nonprofit organization, and the prison itself was owned either by the organization or by the public, I take it that this effectively eliminates the problems of wrongful financial profit and the, pro the profit as a perverse incentive, incentive. The organization would not be in violation of the principle that no one should seek to profit from suffering caused by their own unjust acts. Why? Well, because it would not be seeking to profit from the enterprise at all. Either those who own or those who run the prison would have a right or a duty to maximize profit or shareholder gains. Unlike the for-profit prison industry, non-profit prisons would have no financial incentive to increase crime rates, recidivism, or societal punitiveness. punitiveness. They could concern themselves with money matters only insofar as this was necessary to ensure the continuance of the prison. They could carry out the entire operation at cost, folding any budget surplus into improving prison conditions, services, and administration. To reduce the risk of impropriety and corruption, the private organization could have an all-volunteer board with no members who have a stake in prison-related industries. Pay staff could be kept to a minimum. Participation from affected communities could be encouraged or even required. Now, of course, it, it might be difficult for a nonprofit organization or even a group of such organizations to raise sufficient funds to build a prison facility or to, to buy or rent the land on which such a prison would sit. 
However, the public could own the land and facilities, and the prison could simply be operated in whole or in part by the private organization. The public-private arrangement will concern prison administration and services on public property, not prison construction or renting of private property. And this, too, should produce concerns about intrusions from, the corporate, act, from corporate actors and the corrupting influence of the profit motive. A nonprofit private prison will secure part of its funding from the public and so will be subject to public accountability measures. But it will also secure some of its funding from private donations. This would enable concerned members of the community to help shape the leadership, the goals, and the operation of the institution, rather than relying exclusively on state bureaucracy and business interest. These private donors could, for example, aim to satisfy higher standards for custodial care than the public prisons are required to. They could offer more or better services to prisoners, including educational, vocational, medical, drug treatment, and reentry services. For those deeply concerned about the plight of disadvantaged blacks, Latinx, Native peoples, and United States social groups that are disproportionately incarcerated, but, but may be, say, quite skeptical that existing governments can be trusted to secure adequate custodial care of prisoners, this kind of public-private arrangement could be an avenue for community control over central elements of law enforcement. It could also be a way to address unacceptable prison conditions. Now, if this is correct, then some outsourcing of penal functions could be, in fact, salutary for the oppressed. Those who call for effective communities to play a significant role in crime control, including civilian oversight of the police, cannot, I don't think, consistently maintain that law enforcement functions to be legitimate must be carried out entirely by public service employees. If unjustly disadvantaged communities are to be truly empowered in the arena of criminal justice, that they have to possess effective private organizations that can counteract abuses of state power and institutional corruption. A nonprofit justice promoting organization that could win a bid to win a jail or a prison could play such a role. Now, when suggesting a role for private nonprofit prisons, I am not claiming that a just society will permit these public functions to be moved to the private sector. This is really just a tentative proposal for non-ideal conditions, for circumstances of injustice. When social conditions are grossly unjust and the state lacks legitimacy in the eyes of the most disadvantaged, private interventions are sometimes justified, even required. Systemic state failure can necessitate aggressive action from civil society. The argument that punishment to be legitimate must be imposed through the collective agency of the public and in the name of the public and so administered solely by public sector employees, democratically authorized to play this role, is not, I think, applicable under conditions of intolerable injustice. Given that the state operates with a serious deficit of legitimacy, the question under these conditions is what practical measures of crime control, or the public <coughs> and private, can be justified to those affected by them, particularly those among the oppressed. So an example of a related necessary civil society intervention to law enforcement under <coughs> just conditions is the use of bail fund organizations. These organizations raise money from private donors to bail out low-income inmates who can't afford, to, to, uh, can't afford their bail costs. Sometimes disadvantaged persons are charged with minor crimes, but they can't raise uh, the money for bail. They're stuck in jail until trial. They often lose their jobs. They're unable to care for their dependents. They're needlessly separated from their families and friends. Support from a nonprofit bail fund makes such persons less likely to be exploited by for-profit bail bond companies. Many in unjustly disadvantaged and racially stigmatized communities are in need of protection against wrongful aggression and violence. Murder, rape, aggravated assault, and so on. Some of the perpetrators of these wrongful harms are tragically themselves members of such communities. Their friends, their family, their co-ethnics, their close associates, their neighbors. So, although members of these communities want these crimes prevented, obviously, and they want highly dangerous persons incapacitated, many, including some victims, are reluctant to hand over criminal offenders to a state they regard as responsible for racialized mass incarceration and inhumane prison conditions. In the right hands, 
non-profit, non-profit private prison administration and services could be a viable, if temporary, alternative. So let me conclude. So I don't know whether the public nonprofit arrangement I've just described is economically feasible. <clears throat> that is, it may be unre- unrealistic to expect private actors who are both trustworthy and genuinely concerned with the plight of prisoners to be able to raise the necessary uh, funds to operate a prison on a nonprofit basis. Perhaps su- such nonprofit organizations would always be outbid by for profit firms, I'm not sure. The arrangement could also be politically unfeasible. <clears throat> in the sense that there may be no practical path to to wrestling prison administration away from the state or from public correctional officers' unions. Or perhaps there's no regulatory regime that can effectively monitor a private prison, whether for-profit or non-profit. But my aim here has really been really to try to establish the principle that the temporary non-profit privatization of central prison function is sometimes morally defensible, and indeed could advance the ends of justice and reduce the burdens on the oppressed under non-ideal conditions. And I also contend that acceptance of this principle is compatible with the abolitionist critique of the prison industrial complex, at least insofar as that critique does not rely on the premise that capitalism is inherently unjust. In addition, the principle is consistent, I think, with resistance to neoliberal governance, at least insofar as such resistance is primarily to public contracts with for-profit companies, and not to all public-private partnerships. Moreover, limited private nonprofit prison administration is, in principle, consistent with the fundamental aims of prison abolitionists, even the most radical. Few, if any, would insist that all prisoners should be immediately released, and that henceforth there must be no new prisoners, regardless of the risks and costs of this money. A world without prisons is clearly a long-term goal, which will require broad structural transformation before prisons are truly obsolete, if they ever are. In the meantime, some limited use of prisons is regrettably a necessary evil. Yet abolitionists don't trust the state to incarcerate in a way that is humane and safe, and that treats prisoners with dignity. Nor do they trust the corporate world to fill the gap. A nonprofit, private entity could be the best option. Thanks. Okay. We'll just allow more questions. We'll move straight to discussion. Uh, since we're being filmed, we have a microphone here, and it might help uh, those who have questions uh, be heard. Uh, so I'll hand this to the first. Graduate student, you'd like to ask a question for students? Okay. Um, thank you a lot. I really enjoyed this talk, and I'm actually quite convinced by the um, conclusion of the positive proposal. Um, but I wondered whether there might be a different option that you haven't considered, which is specifically, when you talked about basically state-operated or publicly owned prisons, you always um, assumed that they would be under pretty direct oversight of the government, just somebody of some kind of minister, um, some kind of state office, I suppose. Um, but obviously, there are options for like publicly owned bodies um, that operate with less direct government influence. So over here in the US, um, the body of judges might be an example within the legal system. If you look to Europe and some other <coughs> nations, a lot of public media companies like the BBC are run this way. And obviously, the BBC has a lot of um, provisions that are supposed to enable them community involvement in decisions that are made and other things. So what would you say about the option of having maybe all prisons or some prisons, say public prisons, run instead by a kind of public body that is detached from direct government um, oversight and so for example, it doesn't have all this kind of tough of crime motivation that come with a kind of, you know, um, representative government in which there are a lot of money and interests, money media interests and so on. Yeah, I'll be totally sympathetic to that. I mean, there's a way in which I guess I didn't see that as outside public um, 
accountability measures. I mean, often uh, I mean, we, you know, we have juries. So it's not as if they have, they, there aren't occasions where, where civilians are, are brought in to, to, to play such a role. But I take it that in that case, that the, the state is still involved in some way in facilitating that. So I don't know. I'm, I'm sympathetic entirely to the, to the thought. Uh, Hi. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much for a really interesting talk. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about the last section, this sort of imagined hybrid model. And one thing that I was thinking about is, you know, even in nonprofit contexts, right, it seems that having private donors who contribute to a nonprofit aim is still really rife with the possibility of corruption and advancing the particular ideological interests of those individuals, right? So in this sort of imagined system where you could have private individuals who are contributing capital, even if the ultimate goal isn't profit, how that could not also itself right, lead to the advancement of a particular ideological agenda that might end up being ultimately to the detriment of the marginalized communities that tend to be imprisoned uh, disproportionately, et cetera. So I was hoping you might say a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, that, I, I mean, part of my initial discussion of corruption was partly to um, suggest that um, it's kind of an ever-present threat, especially in large, large organizations, uh, uh, and especially when people can be moved, you know, not just by money. People move by other things other than, than money, um, and, and sometimes they really advance various interests that they have um, uh, by how they donate their money. There's no, there's no question that that's that that's true. So I, I didn't mean to suggest in that part of the discussion that that you could entirely eliminate that problem, but that it's, um, it's a problem that, that exists uh, you know, in the public sector and in the private, for-profit and non-profit sector. It's a, general, it's a, general, a, a quite general problem. I guess would be the question would be whether it's more, it's more likely to have a corrupting influence on, uh, say, a given prison playing the public role it's supposed to play than the alternatives. So that, I don't know the answer to that. My guess is that it would, it's less likely to be have, have as corrupting an influence as uh, the, the, the drive for, for profit, and, profit and capital accumulation, but I could, could be wrong about that. I'm sure. yeah. Oh yeah, so yeah, it's kind of like a similar question. Like I was wondering if like uh, the problems with incarceration have more to do with like less with the nature of the organization than like the nature of its incentives. So like, for example, like if you reform the incentives such that, you know, these organizations have to like output like lower recidivism or like higher income uh, outcomes for inmates and things like that, um, whether or not like for-profit uh, prisons or maybe the state or something can match it better. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if like nonprofits could either be lazy or deeply ideological, like Christian, I don't know, so conversion type things. So. Right, I mean, it, the first part of the question, I take it, 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 it I, I didn't really keep pursuing, and I could, the, the question of regulation is, um, is, is whether you, you, you could clearly set up the contract in a way that depended on meeting certain benchmarks in terms of recidivism, and, and sometimes that's done. <laughs> um, and that could be done whether it's a for-profit a, a for or non, non-profit. So, I mean, we're sort of down into the weeds a little bit about, ex about, about how the institution will work, right? And, like, and so in many of these cases, we're trying to figure out, is there a regulatory regime that will prevent the ever-present perverse incentives from disrupting its ability to carry out the, the public game? And in each domain we, we, have to, we raise it, we, it, we might get different results. Um, and so I didn't need to, to, to suggest that... Um, uh, that avenue of inquiry, I think that to, to reject that avenue of inquiry, I think you would have to ask the question about whether there's, it's possible, even in the case of a for-profit uh, prison, whether you can set up the, the incentive structure about how the contract's set up to basically say, you know, if you have this many people who commit suicide, or this many people who are injured inside, or this many people who return to prison, you can set a bunch of benchmarks of that sort, 
and then cancel contracts if they're not met and so on. So, uh, but whether that will be effective and after that's an institutional design, regulatory question that I'm not equipped to, to try to answer, but those are the right questions to ask, I think. I mean, what I think that brings out, and, and I'm a part of what I was trying to get at, I mean, I'm not, my, my inclination is to think of this, in, in this question about privatization of public functions, um, that often the, the, the issues are of that sort, that is, is there a regulatory regime, and maybe sometimes you think there isn't, like, I don't, uh, I'm not really worried about, um, uh, private, privatizing some parts of sanitation, right? There are private companies that pick up my trash, uh, and that can be regulated. And you, 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 even though you know there can be some first incentives there, you can regulate that in a way. And but maybe in other domains, it's much harder to do, or you need something, or you need so much bureaucracy to do it that it doesn't even make sense to, to do this. But those are the right questions to ask. But it suggests that the problem is not a a, a, a kind of question of of, of more principle. Uh, exactly, and that's, that's what I was trying to highlight, didn't Yeah, I'm afraid there's one more of those questions here. Hi. Yeah, um, but, yeah, because I was concerned about the, the potential lack of, or the opacity that can be created by having the um, non-profits run it. Uh, currently, I'm engaged in, the, in a campaign to renovate a homeless shelter up in Washington Heights where I live. And so we did a visit, it's run by a nonprofit called Project Renewal, and we went, they were defensive, but they let us in, and as soon as we realized that the place needs to be completely remodeled, uh, we got um, a congressperson and two politicians to come into a visit, all of a sudden there were some rules on why they couldn't visit, the visit has to be scheduled some other way, and the Congress people tried to um, get the visit to happen, but they couldn't, and you're left in this gray area where like the nonprofit says, it's not us, it's government, and the government says, it's not us, it's some weird number of regulation. And so that would be my concern about. Um. Which the concern is specifically that uh, then us as a community have to go through a lot more work to, to push for something. There is not <coughs> as clear a mechanism as if it is publicly regulated and you know, the community board decides on the funding. Yeah, so I, I do want to say, so, um, so I, the, the argument is not supposed to be that you know, if we had something approaching approaching a, a, a reasonably just society, that we would want to do this. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, not arguing that. So, so I'm trying to. So, um, we're you know, sort of in a set of, of circumstances where there are a, a, a range of, you know, in my judgment, a range of rather serious structural injustices, um, and so the, the choices that we're making are against the background of that, right? So, so we have to. So we're really making comparisons, right? I mean, to what extent is, can we expect the, you know, the, the state to, to carry out these functions? Um, uh, you know, and, and do we need temporary measures until we can uh, correct enough structurally that we can have enough confidence that it could do it? So that's really the context in which I'm raising the questions. It's not, it's not really a, about, like, ideally we should do it like, you know, like this. Uh, it's just, this is the situation we, we face, and we and we might we might think that uh, uh, some nonprofit privatization, as uh, temporary measure, uh, uh, might be the best alternative. Um, thanks so much for this, and I know my father would have uh, appreciated this and had a lot to say in the Q and A. Um, I don't know what it is, but I have two uh, like questions. Um, so uh, at the end, you talked about the question of political feasibility, um, and you know, if we don't, we may not live in the worst of all possible worlds, um, but you know, abstractly speaking, we have publicly funded police and prisons without public accountability, and we have for-profit private prisons at the same time. We even have some nonprofit detention centers, as we saw with the family separations and the family detention of um, extra-legal immigrants. Um, so the question, um, I, have, I have basically an A and a B of the same question. So there's a question of efficacy. Um, uh, first of all, uh, is it possible um, to attain even moderate reforms without radical demands, um, such as the politics of abolition implied? Um, and then the question of, especially, especially in this context where um, there has been so little movement um, around the carceral state um, in the last few decades, um, and the question of power, uh, which is about um, which reforms are empowering to affected populations and which reforms are disempowering or disenfranchising. 
and it seems that carceral solutions in general, at least in interaction with the political and economic structures that we have, uh, any reforms that have been proposed have been generally disempowered with the exception of felon reenfranchisement and laws and so on. So I'm just curious what uh, your take is on efficacy and power. Easy questions, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's always a risk when you try to um, do a kind of philosophical probing of a position. Um, that's largely put forward and advanced by people in, in Asian activism. So there's a, one thing I think is important to do, in another, in another way it can, it can, you can be at cross purposes in, in, in some way. So I sort of see myself at, you know, there are those moments where, you know, I think this is true of Martin Luther King, right? Like you're, you're engaged in a struggle, and there are various things you're doing tactically, making tactical decisions, and, and, and so on. And then you have moments where you sit back and reflect on what you're doing and why. And so I see myself kind of doing that second thing. So, um, so I'm not really addressing the question about like whether it makes sense to make a radical demand. That's a tactical question. So you know you have to figure out what it is that you, um, you know, what you stand for and why. Um, and then it might turn out that you're in a tactical situation that requires, uh, you know demanding something that you don't really expect to get, but that, that maybe will get you more that you want, but, but you're clear in your mind what, what you, about what it is that you want. I do have one slight worry here. Um, sometimes when I've been talking, I've been, been trying to write a, a, a book about prison abolition generally, just as a part of it, and sometimes when I'm discussing it with people, they'll, they'll re retreat to um, it's just rhetorical or something like that, or, 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 or what, I mean, Davis, I've asked her, not rhetorical, but, but, say, um, um, but uh, and, I, and, I, and I worry about that, because I think, I mean, there's a kind of small Democrat <coughs> position that is kind of in the background, right, which is that like, it's important to be, be, be forthright about what you stand, what you stand for, and why, to the people who you're inviting to join your movement, and, and, and it's, it, I, I it's problematically vanguardist to, 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 be, to be concealing what it is you're trying to, to achieve um, in, in, in this way. That's a long conversation, but it's a, but that is more a question of principle and not a question just of, ta of, 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 of tactics. I'm not sure I know how to answer the, 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 the second one. I think it's going to be a case by case. Sometimes, I mean, the, the prison, prisons in the United States is really a vast network of prisons. It's a really complicated scheme because, you know, there's like this, you know, whatever, the 18th and whatever are federal prisons, there's all these state prisons, there's jails, there's detention centers, so it's really a vast thing, and I don't know that there's any one answer. Like, maybe you don't get the same answer to every, in every case. It might be, in some cases, it makes sense, in some cases not. You know, just like I think in some states, I mean, people often, you know, often some of the private prisons are not what you might expect. Um, there are places where there are almost sometimes where there's no people of color really at all, right? But it's there, there are, there are cost reasons for doing it. Um, so I'm not, so I don't, it's not a one size fits all. You have to kind of see what makes the most sense in, 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 that, in that circumstance. And if it looks like it's just going to be disempowering, then that's a reason not to do it, I take it. Uh, no, it's inadequate, but that's the system. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Um, just try to express what, what made me uncomfortable about the argument, picking up on a couple of things that were already uh, said. The way, I had a very Socratic sense that as I was going, I was following each of the steps and each of them seemed reasonable, but then where we ended up, I was, I was less happy with it. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, how did I get here? I don't buy that conclusion. Um, and I didn't want to jump back to the abolished capitalism, which is where you were, you were um, part of it. But um, it seems to me that the, the moral objection, the moral worry and the worry about injustice has now shifted to what we were talking about in the Q&A as the regulatory scheme. So the point is, is if there was a good enough oversight, as it were, regulatory ways of eliminating the ideological investment of different actors within the whole system, whether for-profit, because the earlier parts of your paper showed how 
even people within a public system, you know, if you want your you want your prison guard job to remain the same, so it's good for you to keep the prison full, or else you're going to lose a job. It's not clear what else you're going to do if you don't have this job, and so on. So there's all these incentives, both in a public case, in the for-profit case, and also in the non-profit case, because there's no reason to think that the non-profit rich people will have a good agenda as opposed to a bad agenda, and so what's going to determine that will be the this regulatory meta rule, you know, these, these regulations that, that then, no matter which, um, no matter which system provides or executes it, executes it according to those regulatory rules. And I take it the, where those regulatory rules are gonna come from is gonna ultimately have to be something like the public or the demo, I mean, so, so in that sense, it's going to be overseen by, or we would want it to be overseen by a democratic, rational process that is genuinely aiming at the good um, for this situation. And then once we've conceded that, I think that if such a thing were in place, then the particular system of dispensing it, you've kind of moved the moral problem up a level, is what it feels like to me it moved up to the to determining the regulatory structure and then it would be yeah sure if that was in place then perhaps any of these methods of executing the system would be satisfactory i don't know if that was clear let me see So the reason, so I, I, the way I was thinking of, uh, of it, to make sure we're on the same page, I'm not sure I'm following. So some people, when they say they're objecting to the prison industrial complex, it seems like they have an in-principle moral objection to it. And so part of what I was going to do is figure out, well, what is it? Like, what is it that you're, that's bothering, that's bothering you about it? Um, um, and I'm trying to say some things that I, Think, some things think are not as powerful as it might seem. Some things have something to it, but it's not clear that it, it, it clearly cuts in favor of public versus, uh, versus um, uh, but, but, I, but I was trying to, where I was trying to get to was that many objections that seem to me, when you, when you get down to it, are not really a, a matter of, of a moral principle. They're, um, that many of them um, are turning on fairly practical questions about institutional design and what's possible. Um, uh, some of them are, are really objections to the, the background structural conditions in which this is playing out. Though it, it seems like it's about prisons, or, but it's, it's because it's situated in a, in a certain context with, you know, with, with, with so much racism, inequality, and other kinds of problems, and you know, weak well, first day, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, but like really that's, the objections are really, it, it, it seems like it's described as an objection to, to, to prisons or a connection between prisons and commerce, but I think often that's not really what's at issue, it's, it's, it's more. So, so the structure was supposed to be a, to, to draw our attention to the ways in which many of the, the disagreements about this are either practical questions about cost effectiveness and, and, and whether a regulatory scheme will make sense um, that, that in, in, um, uh, in this context, or that context, with, with a for with a for profit or non profit prison, um, and some of them are really just about these background um, conditions. In which case, now we step back and we, we're asking a different question. Now we're trying to figure out what can you justify to people under these unjust conditions, given that you do need to do something about at least some of the crime, mm -hmm. um, and then that. It, that was the way I meant it to be to be structured. Of course, you you, I don't. If you if if your democratic institutions are so corrupt and worthless, then this is we're having a different conversation, right? So so part of it is like to what extent are are there the democratic institutions you do have robust enough to allow people in civil society to collaborate, work together to make various changes and to protect the weak and vulnerable as they try to make those changes. So that was, that's the picture that I'm trying to articulate. And if it, so if it's, it might be that 
things are worse than I think. I'm letting my friends say that it is. <laughs> so, um, uh, in which case, we'd be, we'd be having a different conversation. But, but the, the thought is that you, you can have people who, and that's part of the bail bonds, was a, was a kind of case where you can, people can organize, people who care about it, especially these communities they have, they often uh, are communities of affiliation, of affinity, as you say, and um, find themselves uh, in conflict with the criminal justice system and they sometimes pull the resources and organize in ways to, to respond to that, but at the same time they still have to deal with sometimes rather serious crimes in their communities. And, uh, and, and they will use the, the, the institution and structures available to kind of bring, to bring that about. Um, that's not an answer I hope at that, but I thought like we were on the same page, I'm hoping closer to the same. Yeah. Matt, it's not a question. So, yes, Sandy. Sorry. Uh, you know, it's okay. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to make mine um, very crisp, too. Uh, thank you so much. I, uh, I'm also uh, finding myself largely persuaded by your positive proposal. But one thing that does worry me about um, allowing for nonprofit organizations to um, uh, run, run prisons, um, at least to some large extent, is that oftentimes nonprofit organizations um, have religious affiliations and, and, um, and religious aims. And that, uh, combined with the fact that prisoners have diminished autonomy, um, you know, would it seem to open the door to a kind of um, coercive religious, um, if, prisoners being subject to um, adopting or abiding by a certain kind of religious view that they, that they wouldn't want to accept. So, um, and that seems to attach, you know, more to the um, to the nonprofit organizations than to a government-run uh, uh, regime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I wouldn't de de deny that the the seriousness of the problem. I mean, of course, the um, religious organizations are already in the, in the, in the public prisons quite extensively. Um, uh, but. So I don't know, I'm not sure that it settles the, but it's a general problem, I, I, I agree, but they're, they're heavily involved in providing prison services already in um, uh, uh, prisons, but it's a serious worry. I don't have a, um, not, I'm not making a particular def defense of sectarian uh, approach to or, or, or denying the worries about uh, uh, sectarian, sectarianism in the context of total institutions, so it's, it's a real one. Uh, I have a question. So um, I appreciate your commitment to small d democratic, big d democratic, whatever, uh, uh, factors. But I'm wondering if um, it's a sort of invitation. I don't know if this is part of a larger project. But what I would like to see, um, subject to a little more critique, not necessarily from the sem only on the, from the standpoint of religion, is what do we mean by nonprofit? And you're kind of keeping them the same as they are now. And in your proposal. And I, I just wonder whether there is, uh, you would want to address at some point the form of organization that would take place within these nonprofits. Because I think that, uh, normatively speaking, there would be an argument for more cooperative ways of organizing them, which I think could be elaborated in, in interesting ways to. Uh, you know, from the standpoint of uh, worker participation and the uh, involvement also of those who are incarcerated in governance um, on the grounds that participating and, and uh, you know, giving uh, powerful um, opportunities to people can itself be educative and beneficial. You might, it would be interesting to think about it. It's just that you're treating them as simply sort of private nonprofits the way we ordinarily think of them. But the problem with a lot of those is that they aren't democratically organized from the stem as much as they could be. They're not collective and they don't see themselves cooperatively enough and also in relation to the community, which should presumably have some input into the functioning of, of, the, of those um, publicly financed but um, collectively uh, operating institutions, uh, worker cooperatively. Owned and not owned, but just operating. So I wonder, I don't know if you want to say anything about it now, but it's an invitation to include a more reflection on that in the ultimate proposal. I do. I do want to do that. I, mean, I did mention that I thought it would be important to have um, yeah, a community involvement and maybe require 
uh, affect communities to have a uh, you know place on the board and very various things. So, but I have you're right. I, I haven't addressed that. Like, have sure, said. and many things to be said about about the organization of uh, nonprofit or organizations. And what, I mean, whether and whether they should be more democratic. I wouldn't want to rule out though, in and not those circumstances, some um, more hierarchical organizations. Uh, that are that are have a, have democratic aims, but may not be internally fully uh, democratic themselves. I wouldn't want to rule that out entirely. I'd be curious if you thought that this should. That yes, you, I do think you should. You think you should always. But, <laughs> but anyway, another the issue is just that normatively, I think it deserves reflection. Very interesting topic. Um, and persuasive on many grounds, but I want to see if I can draw oh, you into, you into um, I want to see if I can draw you into a topic that is not so much focused here. I mean, what I think is really important about this work is that you're raising the issue of the need to have security from crime, especially for marginalized and oppressed communities. And I think that is a moral claim, and I think it's one that's not often as part of this conversation as much as it needs to be, and it creates splits in communities, and you know. So I think that's you're taking that as um, a starting point that security from crime is is a legitimate concern. But then, of course, the question is how effective are prisons in creating security from crime. And the, the argument is that um, there are other methods to reduce crime, um, such as economic justice, arguments that you make yourself in dark ghettos, um, the ways in which we define crime, uh, you know, uh, and the, like marijuana, the selling of marijuana, which has many hundreds of thousands of people in prison, because of that definition, which is specious. So obviously there's work to be done there. Um, mental health, mediation, most of the abolitionists focus a lot on these alternative to prisons um, as a way to provide security from crime that does not uh, require prisons. Now, I, I agree with you. I, I think all of, these all of these methods should be pursued to the maximum I don't know that that's going to lead us to not having any prisons whatsoever. But these methods lead us into a public debate. We can't retreat from the state or the public sphere to have those conversations. How is crime defined? How does the justice system work? Why aren't mediation procedures more possible? Why is there no economic justice in this country? And why is there no um, mental health? facilities in this country. So that, you know, so your argument is great is leading us to the private sphere, but all of this that really will provide security from crime draws us back into that public fight. So do, you, do you agree? I, I, I do. I mean, I mean, I, so the end of, of our prison's obsolete, Davis runs through a range of, she says, there's no one alternative right there. There's a range of things, including Racial and economic justice, but many things, right? Healthcare, mental health care, a range of things you would need to do. Structural transformation in order to make it a case where you didn't really need to use incarceration to 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 to, to deal with crime. Um, so I don't disagree with any of that, um, but it's still there's um, two questions. There's going to be a question of um, what do we do until we establish those. Changes, um, uh, and then there's and then there's a question of I mean we, a question of principle. We might, we might I, I actually base agnostic on if we were to, if we were to do that whether we would need prisons. I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. Actually, but, Let's find <laughs> but, out. Yeah, uh, of course. But I mean that's the same. That, but, but of course you should, the reform that doesn't it's not going to give you a distinction between a reformer and an abolitionist. So a radical reformer will presumably also. Um, who's concerned about social justice would, would, would of course want to not rely on prisons if you don't need to. Um, so you try to create conditions where you don't need to. Uh, 
but, but, but you, might. you might. You might find that, that you do. But of course, that, that still leaves all these questions about well, what kinds of things would it make sense to, to criminalize and penalize through incarceration. And I would have a, a much narrower range of things than, than, we, than, we, than we currently do here and, and lots of other places. So a much, much smaller range of things, things that cause kind of um, uh, irreparable harm and trauma, I think, um, need to be deterred. So I don't, um, not just repair, because often they can't be repaired. So, um, so sometimes you need to take action so as to um, provide incentive for people not to do those things. So, uh, but I still would be, a, I would consider a narrow range of things. Certainly I don't think you really needed to so much to deal with um, um, uh, drug abuse, and there are questions about whether how much of that you should really criminalize, and all those kinds of questions. And there are a bunch of uh, economic crimes that you know I think you can really you can't really justify using incarceration to criminalize and so on. So yeah, it's a whole you have to have a discussion about that. And of course, a lot of the agitation around criminal justice is precisely about those things. Right? It's precisely about what should be criminalized, what's the appropriate penalty, what and, and so on and so forth. So I'm not ruling any of that. I still think there will be a remainder. There will be some things. Um, and often in the most disadvantaged communities, they're often the ones the most subjected to interpersonal violence. Um, and you're right, people, when, when discussions of mass incarceration and, and abolition, they're often really reluctant to talk about that very directly. And I think that's um, a big mistake. But uh, I mean, you was not Roddy Shearer, and me and my comrades, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tom, please. Hi. Um, thanks very much for the talk. So, I've got a bit of a worry about the um, definition of profit in Section 3, and in the light of that, some worries about what you say in Section 5 in response to the kind of concerns about what might be wrong about profiting from prisons. So, the, the trouble I have with the definition of profit is the phrase, costs needed. This idea that Profit is financial benefit that, where the amount raised from the revenue is greater than the costs needed to continue the enterprise. And my thought is something like, let's say you're on the board of a private prison, and I'm an extremely wealthy person that's been a CEO of several other private prisons, and I'm out of work now, and you need to hire a new CEO. And I'm roughly the only person with the experience and the contacts and the reputation to really do the role of CEO for your prison um, in order to keep you competitive or something like that. Uh, and I know that, so I say, well, I'm only going to be your CEO if you pay me half a million dollars a year, right? Uh, now you might say, well, unless we give this guy the half a million, he's not going to come and we're not going to be competitive, so this is a necessary cost. Right? So it's not profit, right? Um, but then we might think, well, actually, the only reason this is a necessary cost is because I'm being a greedy bastard and I'm saying I'm not going to do this work unless you give me an unreasonably high amount of compensation. Um, and in the light of those sorts of worries, I wonder if in, in the section in, in section 5 when you were responding to, like, is it wrong to financially gain from the suffering of others in a prison context? And you have this, this quite persuasive thought that, well, you know, the people who work in these prisons, they've got to get paid for their, their work. They've got to get some financial gain. I think, well, sure, they've got to get financial gain to get by, right? They've got to get paid enough, right? But what I have a problem with is the sort of the extreme levels of compensation that one might see uh, in, in the case of the CEO making half a million. Maybe there's a sense that there's an unreasonable amount of financial gain such that that is morally impermissible to, to get that much from prisons or something like that. Right? No, good point. I, I, okay. um, you, I mean, I think you're right with that. that it's a little too behind the back of the napkin uh, account of what profit means. Um, but, I mean, sometimes, so a lot of what happens in CEO, CEO pay is, is, is um, um, kind of Corruption and <laughs> collusion. Right? So I mean, so let's put that to one side. So, it, but, but but sometimes it's um, is is their their compensation is, is is driven up by competition. So for for their services and whatnot, and that can be true in private um, 
World Vision as well, you know, as I'm learning. <laughs> you believe it. Um, actually, believe it or not, on the, on the search committee for our new athletic director. Uh, um, and you learn things. Uh, <laughs> you know, when you're trying to identify somebody you want. Uh, and often the person you want, if it's a very demanding job person you want, they have a lot of options, um, and, and so on. So, and to, to attract them to it, you, you often have. So I want to separate the case where, you know, um, you're, you're, you're going after certain talented people who have experience to run a large organization, and their compensation has been driven up by the fact that other people want their services. And I would say that could be regarded, could fit as a part of necess necessary. Um, people might be exaggerating the extent to which their talent is so unique. I mean, I agree, but I mean, but um, but but in the cases where it is, I, I would think I'd be appropriately thought of as part of as part of the cost. Um, thanks. So my question is more about kind of the methodological goalposts of the project. So in particular about this idea that we should seek. Um, an argument against for-profit prisons that doesn't rely on wanting to abolish capitalism. So I have like a two-part question and the second part is the probably bigger part. But um, so I get that you're trying to come up with an argument against them that um, doesn't that doesn't just dissolve into an argument that we ought to abolish capitalism. But I'm wondering if one way of formulating the, the criticism of the prison industrial complex that doesn't come directly from Davis is as a critique of neoliberalism rather than capitalism as such. And then in that case, part of the worry is about corporate capture um, of the institutions that would be supposed to be regulating for-profit prisons and so on. Um, I think one good reason for thinking of it that way is that it's analogous to the idea of a military industrial complex where there's a revolving door between industry and the people who are supposed to be regulating the industry. So I guess the first part of the question is just um, without, like, isn't there an argument to be made that, like, falls short of recommending nonprofit prisons that says what we need to, like, we should be, um, like one of the main problems with for-profit prisons is this like capture of all of the institutions that are supposed to regulate prisons and what we should be trying to work against that. So that's the first part. The second part, I feel though, and this is the second part, like I think you're probably gonna answer me by um, saying that if that's true, then we still, like that doesn't justify the focus on for-profit prisons because then we should just be working against the, um, the uh, the corporate capture of the institutions. And that makes, if that's how you want to answer me, then I guess my second question, which is a big question, is like, why, um, why does, like, why are we, like, why can't it just be a question of political strategy that, like, we should focus on for profit prisons because of, like, they happen to be, a, like, a fulcrum, like, where we can put pressure on the government right now to do something about this nexus of concerns? Like, why is the non ideal theorist off the hook, like, on the hook, when they say that, um, like, when they say we should focus on problem X, like, why are they on the hook for saying that, like, the, the only reason they should focus on problem, like, that the, they need a warrant to focus on problem X that comes from, like, that is directly related to problem Y being a real problem. Like, I feel like there's, for me at least, it feels like there's an assumption here that the non-ideal theorist needs to, like, strategically recommend whatever is conceptually most important um, for fighting the battle they want to fight, but why? Yeah, okay. Um, so in the first part, I, I don't, I mean, I'm really, I can mean, answer, but in, in, in really kind of one answer for both of them, anyway. So, uh, I think myself is doing non-ideal theory, and I think, and I, um, but, but it's, it's trying to figure out the answers to some questions of political morality. It's not trying to answer questions about strategy and tactics which um, are obviously crucially important, but I, but I think are constrained in various ways by the questions of political morality. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm really just trying to answer those. So it might be, I'm not, I'm, I, don't, I didn't take myself to be saying anything about where one ought to focus your political energies. You focus your political energies where there are levers to change things. 
um, or where you might be able to invite others who might be, be, be join in with you. And if that's if that's prison industrial complex, then it's prison industrial complex. So I, I didn't mean to be saying anything to be saying, don't focus on that. I, I, I'm not saying. I'm really just trying to understand um, what the objection is to it and to get some clarity about it uh, in, 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 in my own mind and, and maybe by reflecting on it um, um, others might benefit. So, uh, so, I, so don't, I hope I'm not interpreting this and say, don't focus on that. So, uh, and, and nor am I sort of, I, I don't mean to be saying anything against, um, you know, either critiques of capitalism or critiques of neoliberalism. I mean, so, by all means, you know, um, I sometimes contribute to those things. So I, I'm not against critiquing those things. I'm really just trying to see to what extent when people, when there's a call for uh, the abolition of the industrial complex, is it, or, or what is it people are really objecting to about it? They're trying to get, some, get clear in my own mind of what the, what's the more basis for it. To what extent is it just, they really just object, they're objecting to capitalism when you get the abolition of the industrial complex for free, right? It's going to fall directly, right? Or if it's, if it's an objection to neoliberal governance, to so all uh, partnerships between the, 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 the state and, and private actors to carry out public functions, that's really the objection. I and mean, that's fine. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that. I can, I, I, as I can imagine, the, uh, arenas where it, it wouldn't be objectionable. I, I really don't object to it in the case of, of, of sanitation, for instance. But, um, or uh, or the, the, the company that drives my, my, my kid to school. So, uh, but, it, but it's, it's, but that's a different thing, right? I mean, that's, a kind of, that's an objection to the view about what governance ought to be, maybe a view about democracy and how to think about it. And I just wanted to be, maybe you all are clear about this, but at least in my mind, when I hear and read, read writings about it or see activism around it, it's not as clear. And so part of it was to try to get some clarity about it. And it's, it does seem to me that often there, either the objection is to capitalism or to neoliberal governance generally, or it's an objection to background structural conditions, and it's not principally an objection to prisons and how to interact with the private sphere. We're almost at the end. Time for just two more questions. Go ahead. Um, thank you uh, for the talk. I was, uh, I was hoping that you could clarify your remarks on um, prison labor. You said that prison labor is a non-distinct form of oppression if we're assuming that we're operating in a just system of capital. But I'm not really sure that's true. Um, uh, the big distinction that I can think of is that uh, if I'm a hypothetical prisoner and a hypothetical prisoner in a just system of capital, um, the big difference between me and somebody, uh, a worker in prison and a worker outside of prison is that uh, I don't have the freedom to leave or choose a different job or really have any say over my labor at all. And for me, that seemed to highlight some, some concerns about the structure of prison itself that I'm not really sure your model addresses, like freedom and autonomy. So, I was, so this has kind of been a similar vein to the last question, but I was curious if you could address those. Thank you. I'll say, I'll say a couple of things. So I distinguish a, a, a couple of things. One, sometimes prison uh, labor is uh, is a part of the community itself, and so one can argue about whether uh, uh, um, forced work can ever be part of the community. I wasn't addressing that here, but sometimes um, I do try to in the, in the book as well. Uh, sometimes the the prison labor is required not as penalty, but as because it's a, a, a view that. Um, uh, the, the, the public shouldn't have to cover uh, all the costs of, of incarceration, that the incarceration should contribute to, 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 to covering the cost of the incarceration. So sometimes that's, in which I wasn't discussing that either. I was really talking about the case where there's a, 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 a private company that is um, getting access to some prison labor where the, 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 the prisoners um, don't have to work for them. But they might. I mean, often, as it turns out, they often want to. But that's a, that's a different issue. But um, um, uh, that was the case, the narrow case I was thinking. It was a case where you, you know you, you're, you're in prison. There's opportunity to make some money, not very much, um, and you can decide I don't, I won't work for them or not. So in some ways, that always strikes me is that they, 
is, it is very different in some ways from the, the normal labor situation, but it maybe it cuts in, a, in, a, in another way. So, right, so part of Marx's point is that, you know, well, you know, um, the, 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 the workers are compelled to, to work for capital through adult compulsion, compulsion of economic relations, through their, through their need. They, they, they can't feed themselves and house themselves. And that's not the situation in the case of prison. So it's not a situation where you, um, you, you, you have... Um, Basic needs met as a matter of um, of custodial care, and, and so you're not under the same economic compulsion to offer up your reward. You might want to make you might, might want to make some money for a variety of reasons. Um, so that was a sense in which I thought it was structurally similar, but it's very different from the other cases where it's like you know if it's Angola, I mean it's a part of it. You're required state prison. Like you're required to work to sustain the sustain the prison as part and it's built into the punishment. That's the hospital that on side. Aaron. Last question. Hi. Um, so I, I had a question about something you brought up at the end, because I was thinking along the lines throughout the talk of, well, isn't there some sort of maybe imperative to have a certain degree of direct democratic control over these sorts of systems, right? And then at the end you say, well, in, in non-idealized contexts, uh, maybe there isn't. And you, you had some examples of this that I'm interested in and familiar with. The, the bail uh, situation, I think there's one in the Bronx that is <coughs> well known. Other things that came to mind were kind of maybe Black Panther health clinics or kind of other extra governmental provisions of services, which uh, are somewhat nonprofit. Maybe that's not exactly a nonprofit, but it's a similar. But one thing that all of these examples have in common is that they, they seem to be provision of service, right? So you're, you're providing some, somebody with something that they would otherwise struggle to get. But in the case of a prison, you're dealing with the imposition of force. Right? So there seems to be kind of a different difference in kind of the institution and its purpose that's there. And I wonder if it's as easy to kind of make that move away from direct democratic control in cases where it's not service position, but kind of imposition of force, or if you have any thoughts about that. Yes, I mean, I, I think it, there is a strong service dimension because custodial care is a big part of the cost <coughs> of prison. So there's a, a pretty strong. It's true that there you're trying to keep keep people in prison, keep from leaving. Um, but it's but but while they're there, you you they, they have lots of needs and they have to be met. So so I, I wouldn't want to wouldn't want to say there's no service. There's a huge service dimension to to imprisonment. Um, some people do. Do think that in the case that, that you, you you can't outsource coercion, and and I'm not sure, um, and, and they might be right. And I, I didn't make my argument to turn that. I meant to, to say that well, that might mean that some some of the 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 the, the things that be carried out in the practice of imprisonment will, will have that the state will have to reserve it and and will not be able to delegate it to, to private actors. Though I imagine that there could be. Depending on what you do in terms of licensing and training and so on, you might be able to allow some private actors to play such a play at least some some role in in, in minimum and medium security prisons um, in ways you might not in, in, a, um, in maximum security or if, if there ever should if there should be probably shouldn't be but if there should be super max maybe you do something different. Um, so, but I mean, but you also you mentioned various institutions, but you think about some other ones, right? I mean, there there are there are private psychiatric, psychiatric hospitals. Um, uh, that uh, have a, a very similar structure to, to prisons. I mean, I regard them as um, when it's involuntary and they allow for involuntary commitment is is basically a type of incarceration. Um, it just is, its aims are not punitive, but it, it has similar it structures very similarly. People aren't just allowed to come and go. All those things, rules of order, all those things are there, and sometimes force is used. Um, to, 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 to deal with some people who are committed uh, to psychiatric hospitals. So I'm not certain that it's that different, but... Yeah, I'm not either. But... Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we can continue this up in the lounge. Um, the seventh floor, please join us at the reception. But please join me in thanking...